It's Pyram King and happy Halloween. And on this Halloween, we are gonna be doing another detailed guide to the Legends of Barovia, an expanded Curse of Strahd campaign. And what's more appropriate on Halloween than the main floor of Ravenloft itself. Now, before I get started, a huge shout out to the supporters. We got over 900 supporters. Check them all out here. They've been contributing to make this epic campaign and all the guides a reality. And special announcement, we have released the first of the free campaign guides. There's a link in the description below. This free PDF campaign guide, it's the campaign guide and player guide, and we'll be releasing a new one each month of all of the content that we've been putting together. Now, now, if you are a supporter on this epic journey, you receive an early edition release playtest version of the PDF guide, and it's through your input and suggestions and corrections I put a final version in it together. It's shipped off to Jesse Winter, who creates an edited version, and it is released eventually so that everyone that loves Curse of Strahd as much as I do can enjoy it for free. Now, as a special thank you to those donating members, you'll get a color version of that premium guide. You'll also get some exclusive tokens, my voice acting sound file, and some art that I make. And I take all of that free content along with the free maps and put it into a Foundry Adventure module, including links back to D&D Beyond. Of course, to use this supplement and content, you'll need to purchase Curse of Strahd to enjoy it. And if you're using the Foundry modules, you should purchase Curse of Strahd on D&D Beyond so that all those D&D Beyond links will work. Huge shout out and thank you to all of you. Again, if you're interested in becoming a member on this epic journey to support me and putting these together and making them free for the community, there are links in the descriptions below. Now, two special acknowledgements. First of all, you know my partner in this epic journey, and that's DM Andy, who's making these gorgeous battle maps. We're gonna be looking at this gorgeous battle map that he's made for the main floor of Ravenloft, and he allows us to include a free WebP version of these in our guides that we'll be looking at today. However, if you want the high resolution 8K version of these maps, you want nighttime, daytime, weather effects, spooky conditions, he makes those exclusively available in his map packs on DM Andy's Patreon page. There's a link down below, highly recommend them. Pick them up whether you're playing on Foundry, Roll20 or Tabletop, they are exquisite. They are the best maps that you're going to find in my personal opinion of the entire Legends of Barovia. A lot of them exclusively made for this campaign. Now, in addition to DM Andy, none of this would happen without Blair, who creates modules, including the famous Scene Packer module for Foundry. He also developed the V9 Plus Adventures. That's what this is. This allows you to play this version of this adventure in version 8 Foundry, version 9 Foundry, or version 10. Now, if you're interested in making your own adventures for Foundry, Blair is an expert in this. There's a link to his Patreon down below. And both Blair and DM Andy, along with Jesse Winters, our editor, are on our Discord channel. We have a Discord channel with over 700 people. It's active people sharing their story ideas, their artwork, their own stat blocks, their campaign stories. It's an amazing community. We're all there to share and make this a wonderful experience for everyone. Come on over and say hello and join us on our Discord channel. Again, huge shout out and thank you to all these amazing supporters. Now let's jump into the main floor of Ravenloft. And before I get started, by that way, we're gonna be following Ravenloft from my perspective. That's me, the player going through Castle Ravenloft. I wanted to share with you a practice which I call the roller coaster of terror. And I thought it would be appropriate to do for Halloween, especially since we're going into Ravenloft. And this is a role-playing practice that I like to incorporate in my guide to elevate the fear, the horror, and to scare my players as they experience Ravenloft or any gothic horror. Now, how does this work? Well, the, the roller coaster of terror has three levels. The first level is unsettling. An unsettling level is when the players see something or experience something that reminds them that they're in a different realm, a forbidden, horrible, macabre realm, that something lurks beyond their grasp. They are not in their element. One of these unsettling moments could be they see a statue and they see the statue shed a tear and as they get closer, they realize the tear is actually blood. And when they touch the blood, it disappears. The shadow blinks 
and it's just a, it's a, the statue blinks and it's just a statue. Or perhaps unsettling is showing some foreshadowing of something that may come or some information that lets them know that they're in a terrible location. Perhaps as they're searching the room, they find a torn dress stained with blood, letting them know that something horrible has happened here. All of these things create unsettling moments for the player characters and the players. The next level on this roller coaster of terror is dread. Dread is when the players, something in the environment, something has changed directly impacting the players, elevating their heart rate, elevating the character's awareness, getting them scared. Perhaps they step into a room and door shuts behind them and all the torches go out and they're cast into sudden darkness. It doesn't necessarily mean that a combat encounter or something horrific will happen, but it's placed them in a place that either they're, they're, un, they're unable to escape or something may be lurking around the, the, the corner. It is an immediate sense of fear, and you've elevated them from unsettling to this moment of dread. Now, if you do this really well, you constantly go up and down this roller coaster of unsettling to dreadful moments until you reach the third moment, which should be shock and awe at the least expected moment, and that's terror. That is the combat encounter. That is the moment that the spider jumps down from the ceiling and lands on the player, or the ghost comes out of the statue and tries to possess the player character. These are the moments where the players are rolling initiative, and the moment of that dread has materialized and become a combat encounter. Now, after these combat counters, these moments of terror, the roller coaster goes back to an unsettling moment. And I've introduced two variants from the Dungeon Master's Guide, both horror checks and despair checks. Now, these may or may not happen, but they're things that you may wish to implement after these terrible ter terror uh, uh, combat encounters happen. If you'd like to read more on the mechanic features of horror and despair checks, they're in the free campaign guide. There's a link down below. Now, I would suggest if you haven't seen it or if you haven't seen it in a while and you want to see a master class of the implementation of the terror roller coaster, see the first alien movie. The first alien movie, these aren't soldiers, these are just freighter people on a deep space freighter encountering an alien. And the entire movie, the first three quarters of the movie, is it constantly on this uh, this roller coaster of unsettling and dread, unsettling and dread. And it's when you least expect it out of the darkness and the monster strike and kills one of the crew members aboard the Nostromo. Now, what's amazing about this movie, we barely see the monster. It's just one creature lurking in the darkness, and the movie keeps us on the edge of our seat. What they've done amazing in this movie is in its conclusion, and the first time I remember seeing this movie, I was waiting for the credits to roll. All the crew are dead. Sigourney Weaver, uh, Ripley has escaped on the escape pod with the, uh, the cat, the, the aliens there and she's ready to go to deep sleep and hibernation, and you're just like waiting for the credits to roll, and you're like, your heart rate slowed down, you're like, finally, this roller coaster is over. And out of the corner of her eye, she sees the mouth of the alien open up, it's yawning, and his mouth comes up, and that spittle drips down, and your heart rate accelerates, and you know at that moment, you have just gone from unsettling to dread to terror. She has to put on the suit and face off against the alien one final moment. It is the masterclass. And if you can emulate that suspense, that moving up and down this roller coaster of unsettling and dread and moments of terror and emulate what Alien has done so well in your campaign, you will certainly enhance the experience that your players will have here in Castle Ravenloft. Now, a little bit about Castle Ravenloft. As you know, Legends of Barovia is an expanded campaign. It's approximately the year 750 when the players are here in Barovia. But if you study the timeline and the history in Legends of Barovia, you realize the castle was built 700 years ago in the year 50. And for almost 300 years, the castle has been lived in by kings and lords and, and knights, and it's gone through the normal kind of medieval uh, machinations of royal courts and everything. It was probably a happier time then. It wasn't until the Great War when Strahd came, defeated the Turk forces, that things turned 
a suddenly dark, very dark. In the year 351, Strahd becomes the vampire. He has murdered his brother, has loved Tatiana, has committed suicide here at Ravenloft, jumping off the, the overlook. And uh, the castle, he, he changes the castle. He hires Artemis, the architect, who builds the big spire, and it transforms from the castle into Ravenloft, named after his mother, mother who had been murdered during the Great War. And the castle actually transforms from this probably beautiful Gothic uh, medieval castle to this Gothic horror location of Ravenloft. And throughout the castle, your players will be encountering things from the past, statues of old knights, the chapel that have seen better days, frescoes, and all of these little moments and these scenes are there to create that unsettling feeling for your character. Your character will realize that this castle once lived in a peaceful time, and it's this transformation into this horrible, dark realm of gothic horror that has become Ravenloft. And this is how one of the elements that we introduce to create these unsettling moments, to let the characters know that there is darkness here, but there was once peace. So we've introduced that. I will point those out through the campaign, and that gives you some background of this castle and some suggestions on how to run your own roller coaster of terror. Now, we're going to enter. We got this gorgeous battle map from DM Andy, and here we are. We're also going to be covering the dinner with Strahd. Really excited about that. As we are at the main door of Ravenloft and we show up as our player characters, there's two massive doors uh, standing in front of you. They're exquisite relief uh, sculptures of battle, epic battle scenes on these doors. But you have an unsettling uh, feeling that you're being watched. Now, if you have a passive perception of 15 or higher, you're gonna notice two gargoyles up above the doors and their eyes are shifting and they're watching you. Now, if your characters are unhidden, they're not in stealth, and they've approached this door openly, the gargoyles will see them and notify Strahd. Think of the gargoyles of kind of like Strahd's you know, uh, door cam, right? He's l watching anything through these gargoyles that, who act as like a scrying mechanism to see anybody approach. Now, if the players are hidden or they're trying to stealth to, to the door, obviously that is going to be different and you might want to have some kind of role to see if the gargoyles pick them up or not. Now, it's important to say, uh, make a very important uh, statement at this point. When the player characters come to Ravenloft, they either come as welcome guest or unwelcome guest. Welcome guest, Strahd is expecting them. Maybe he's invited them to dinner. Maybe he's invited them there or the, they're going there and he's expecting them to come there. If they're expected, these doors will be open. They will unlock and open and welcome the players inside. Magically, Strahd will open the doors. He'll see the gargoyles, will see the players and he will open the doors as the players approach. If the players are unwelcomed, they're gonna have a difficulty getting into this door. And we're gonna talk about that as the players enter into the foyer here. We're gonna bring the players into the, the foyer here and talk about the foyer and we'll zoom in here and look at this from the player's perspective. Now there's two cauldrons burn brightly, but you notice no heat from them. A release sculpture uh, on the flanking walls uh, includes the Lord of Barovia kind of looking over the land from Castle Ravenloft and perched in the four corners of these massive columns are stone, ornate stone carved dragons on four, all four of these. Now as the players enter into the foyer, if they are welcome guests, they didn't break through the door, the doors behind them will shut and lock and as they do, the doors in front of them will open up. This happens as soon as all the players get in there. Now the stone dragons up there are just stone dragons. The players won't see anything unusual about them. And as long as they're welcome guests, nothing happens. However, if the players become unwelcome guests here, these stone dragons come to life. They are constructs and they will attack the players. And here they are, we'll just bring them out so you can see them here and they will attack the players. Now the stat block of these stone dragons are the exact same thing as rules as written as the whelps. The only difference is I made is to the fact that they're, cons they're constructs, they're stone dragons that will attack players. Now, some important elements about the combat encounter here. The stone dragons will never leave this room. They are kind of locked to being in this room. They are at the first line of protection. The stone dragons will not attack or become uh, dragons 
unless the players are unwelcome. So if they're trying to break through the door or if they're trying to escape and the doors are locked, the stone dragons will attack them. If the players manage to escape out of the foyer, the stone dragons return to their perches and turn to stone dragons. Now, if Strahd is defeated, the stone dragons will not animate. They animate only when he is, well, immortal. He's not defeated or been destroyed. So they only work at those moments and they're controlled by Strahd. Let's we'll talk a little bit about this main door. The main door will unlock 10 minutes before midnight and open, and then it will reclose and lock again at midnight. We'll explain that when we do the dinner with Strahd. At that moment, the players can leave. Now, if the players get to this door and they're trying to get out, they can try to attempt to use thieves tools to lock pick the door. It's a DC 20 check, uh, lock picking check with uh, tools. If they fail on a one through five, their tools get broken inside the, the lock and they're not able to use their tools anymore. You can use a strength check DC 24 with a prying tool to pry these doors open. These doors are gonna be hard to get open. And with these stone dragons coming to life, it's gonna make things quite difficult for the players to escape at this moment. Now, if the players are invited guests and they enter in to the great hall here, they're going to see, and then we'll just read the description here, they're gonna see Rahad in here waiting for them. There are four massive columns. We can see them here in the Great Hall that rise up into the darkness. Large torch sconces adorn the columns, filling the room with an eerie glow. Flickering torchlight catches the faces of eight gargoyles perched high up, motionless on the rim of the dome ceiling above. The dome ceiling, barely illuminated, is a fresco of a warm summer day with clouds in the sun, now faded and cracked of a memory long forgotten. To the north side is a wide staircase that leads up, candles placed haphazardly along the steps. To the south is a hallway lit by torches, and to the east are a set of double doors. Now what's interesting here is, again, this is a moment of unsettling. You see a contrast between this barely illuminated, faded fresco of this dome ceiling of a warm summer day, forgotten time long before this became Ravenloft, in contrast with gargoyles motionlessly sitting up there around the dome ceiling. So this is one of those unsettling moments. Now, if the players are welcomed here, the gargoyles will sit up there and they will not attack. And Rahadin will be waiting here. Now, this is my version of Rahadin. Again, a little bit of Easter egg. I don't know if you know who that is. You may be able to figure out who that is, who I've used uh, to emulate Rahadin. And he will welcome the party. He will say, welcome to Castle Ravenloft. The master has been expecting you. Ah, I see you've noticed our little friends. Do not fear, they will not bite unless you provoke them. This way, please. And he will lead the players to the dining room for the dinner with Strahd. As we approach down the hallway, and Rodden leads us down this hallway, let me bring up the, uh, down this hallway, the torch lights the vaulted halls with extends to the south. At the end of the hallway, a cold chill emanates from the east that ends in a spiral staircase over here. Flanking the wall at the base of the wall at the south end is a suit of black armor. And as you approach these doors, you begin to hear the sound of a melancholy uh, melody played on an organ. Let's talk about the armor here briefly. You'll see a black armor sitting. If you inspect the armor, it is ornate dark black armor. It's armor plate plus one. However, this armor, if the players take it and don it, it is cursed. They will not be able to remove it. The armor plate that they have, they will get the bonus of the plus one. However, they will suffer disadvantage on all dexterity saves and dexterity checks. It is a horrible curse. So you'll have really great plate armor. Good luck on those dexterity saves and those dexterity checks. The only way to get this armor off is by remove curse. So we'll see what happens. It could could create a fun and crazy situation for the players. Now, as the players approach these doors to the dining room, they're gonna hear this organ music. Now, what's important to note here, if you've been following the Legends of Barovia guides, it is possible that the players at the Wizards of Wine are captured or follow Strahd, uh, and they are captured by Strahd. If that is the case, you'll begin the session where the players are sitting around the dining room table dressed in fine dinner attire, and Strahd will be playing the organ. They will have no weapons and no armors. 
yet all of that will be returned to them. That's if they've, they've been captured by Strahd. You can run it however they get captured by Strahd, but they don't remember anything. They just begin waking up sitting around the dining room table as Strahd is playing the organ. However, if the players are invited to dinner or expected by Strahd and they're gonna have dinner with Strahd, this will be how you they enter is through this door here. Now, rather than showing you the battle map first, the players are gonna begin at the outside of this door is they're gonna begin hearing the organ playing. And I selected a piece of music uh, by Johann Sebastian Bach called Come Sweet Death. And I imagine, you can hear it here. I'm not sure, I'll just turn it up a little bit. This is a very sad and dramatic piece of music that I selected that Strahd would be playing. And I imagine that Strahd is playing this and he is introspective of that moment, thinking about the horrific atrocities, the murder of his brother, the loss of Tatiana, living this undead immortal life that he can't escape from. And he's playing this melancholy, dark, sad tune on the organ. Now we're gonna look at a theater of the mind map here. Let me go ahead and bring that in here. And Strahd is playing We've got the pipe organ here. Let's describe this. The players enter into the dining hall. A fire blazes in the hearth to the south. Three large chandeliers flicker overhead, illuminating the room. A large faded fresco of a hunt in the forest covers the north wall. Before you, a dining table is set with the finest silver and crystal and laden with a feast for a king. The far west wall stands a pipe organ decorated with skulls and skeletons in a macabre manner. The organ is flanked by two full-length mirrors. You are memorized by the melancholy me uh, melody. You feel a deep loss and longing for happier times. A figure sits with their back to you playing the dramatic piece that echoes throughout the room. As you take in the sight before you, the doors shut. So you've got a moment of an unsettling moment where you're seeing this faded fresco, you're hearing this dramatic, sad, melancholy music, and then dread sets in as the doors shut behind you. Now at this moment, while you bring the players to this theater, the mind map, you can see the pipe organ here uh, with the skulls on it playing this, this melancholy song here. And this is just the first three minutes of Come Sweet Death. Now, I would really role play this scene slowly. Everything that's gonna happen here is this is gonna be an epic encounter with Strahd. The dinner with Strahd is a special moment in the entire campaign between your players and him. Now, the players must succeed as soon as they start hearing this music and they enter the room, the doors close. They must succeed a DC 10 wisdom save. Don't tell them what the, the, the DC is. Just say, I need everyone to roll a wisdom save as the music is playing. If they succeed, they will recognize the tune as Come Sweet Death. It is a tune from far off lands. It's well known for, by all your players and it's usually played during the time of mourning. And so it's a tune that they recognize. The players that fail the wisdom save will be swept up by this melancholy, sad tune. They will think of death, loved ones that have been lost, family, uh, tears will begin to well up. The player characters who failed will also roll disadvantage on their charisma and wisdom checks and saving throws while the song is playing and for 10 minutes after the song. This means perception, uh, this means uh, persuasion, especially persuasion and deception checks they will be rolling disadvantage on. Now, when the music stops and comes to a stop, Strahd will turn around and you will see him. Here's, here's my Strahd here, another Easter egg. I'll let you figure out who that is. This is my version of what I see Strahd and he will welcome the players and I have some of my voice acting here. Let's see if you, uh, if it comes out well or not. Strahd says to the players as he turns around and finishes playing, Welcome to Castle Ravenloft. I hope your visit is most comfortable. 
Now, he will usher the players to sit around the table. Now, at this point, if again, as I mentioned before, if the players were captured, perhaps you're using that Wizards of the Wine scenario where Strahd captures the players or the players follow Strahd and they go back to Ravenloft, they will be they will wake up to that organ music as they sit around the table. As they come to, they will be dressed in fine dinner attire, no weapons, no armor. Again, their weapons and all their equipment, money, and everything will be returned to them, and I will tell you in just a second, but they will wake up. Otherwise, he will tell you to come and have a seat. If you are running the Merchant Player Hook quest, now that can be found, again, in the free campaign guide in the link down below. This is a one of the player's family members. It could be father, mother, aunt, uncle, grandfather, grandmother, brother, sister, is a merchant who had traveled almost a year ago to Barovia in search of some fav- uh, very fabled, expensive wines for a noble family, and they have disappeared, and that player is searching for them. Well, they're going to see their relative, the merchant, sitting next to Strahd at the head of the table. Now, the players will also notice with a passive perception 15 or higher that there's no plate in front of Strahd. There's a single crystal glass that looks like it's wine, but it's actually blood, and he sits down with the players. And if the merchant's there, the merchant is sitting right next to him. And Strahd will say this, and this here is a quest. This is why Strahd has invited you to Castle Ravenloft. I have invited you here, as I am in need of your services. I have sought the aid of stout adventurers to acquire an item which is of great interest to me. It is but a small green gem, and was found at the Wizards of Vines, but has recently gone missing. If you were to acquire this gem for me, I would be most grateful, and may help you find a way through the mist which have trapped you here. Of course, I would also grant you some valuable treasure, so your time in Barovia is not without its rewards. This is excellent because it does several things. Number one, it creates a reason for having this dinner with Strahd. Number two, it ties you directly to Strahd and weaves in the fey quest, the epic fey quest of the gems that you are trying to find and get in order to, to free the fey and eventually defeat Strahd. He wants one of these gems. It also puts you in a predicament. Strahd, if you get this green gem for Strahd, well, he's going to let you go through the mist, and he will reward you with a great treasure. Whatever that treasure is, that's really up to you. But now you've created a important relationship with Strahd at this point. He sees you as somebody that can do something for him, and that's how Strahd operates. He doesn't do a lot of things himself, only when he has to. He uses his minions and other people and uses favors. He is he is a master, not only a tactician in combat, but a master political manipulator, and so he's manipulated you. Now, if you're running that merchant hook and that merchant is sitting there, this is what Strahd will say. My guest has shared with me many tales of their fabulous journeys throughout the world. I have granted them every available hospitality that someone in my unique position can afford. They have and will remain safe, and of course are free to leave once you have acquired the gem. In the meantime, They will remain here as my guest, where I can provide them protection. As you know, Barovia can be such a dangerous place, and we wish for our merchant friend to have a safe visit. This escalates the relationship with Strahd. Now that family member, that merchant there, is a guest. Now the merchant's not hurt. They're in fine dinner attire. They've been treated, as Strahd has said. Strahd is up front. They've been treated with respect. They've been treated with hospitality. They've been staying there. They just can't leave Ravenloft. They're having fine dinners. 
but they're in Ravenloft, very much like the original Bram Stoker Dracula with with Harker there. Dracula wasn't didn't tie him up and 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 throw him in prison. He is there now. This does create some interesting role playing opportunities for your players. Perhaps the merchant family member slips a note to the player, something about Castle Ravenloft, maybe some secret that they found, maybe where they're being held. It also allows the players to probably think and discuss among themselves. Maybe it's a rescue operation that they're going to need to do because they don't want to bring Straw the gem. Maybe they got to play Straw a little bit. They got now got to figure out how to rescue this family member, this merchant, who is now a guest, a permanent guest of Straw. And Straw's not going to let them go until you bring him back a gem. Now you've got both the carrot that Straw's offered of the treasure and through the mist and the stick. If you don't bring it to me, your merchant family member will be killed. Now, after this, what Strahd does is he offers the players to explore the castle, and this is what Strahd says. Let me delete these. All of these texts are both in the player guide and the voice acting sound files. If you're not using Foundry, you can use these as well because I give the, the members the voice acting sound files. So here we go. After your meal, you are welcome to explore the main floor of my humble castle, which has seen far better days. However, the upper floors are off limit, and please do not venture down into the crypts. You must leave at midnight. A carriage will await you at the front courtyard to take you to the western gates. If you find yourself here after midnight, your presence is no longer welcome, and I will be unable to guarantee your safety. Now this creates a unique moment for the players after their dinner. The entire main floor, this map, the players can explore and the creatures that are under straw control, such as the stone dragons and the gargoyles, will not attack the players. This also allows the players who were captured and do not have their armor and weapons to feel relatively, relatively is the key word, safe to explore the main floor. However, as Strahd warns the players specifically here, going to the upper floors or going to the crypt is not safe. And in addition, the players must be at the front courtyard before midnight. That is why the doors unlock and open 10 minutes before midnight. They reshut and lock after midnight. And after midnight, the players are no longer welcomed in Castle Ravenloft. That is when the stone dragons, the gargoyles, and any other creatures that are controlled by Strahd will attack the players. Now, even though the players are welcome, there are some traps and some things in here that are beyond Strahd's control that could harm the player, even though that they are welcome guests. And we'll be pointing those out at this point. But this gives the players, both the players that are, are not armed and without armor, or the players that were invited to dinner, the ability to explore the main floor. This is a, a great way to gather some information in the lay of the land and to find a particular quest item from the Argenvoss Suffering Quest, which is the icon of Ravenloft. We'll be talking about that as well. In addition, you may suggest to Strahd that they'd like to be accompanied. They haven't seen their family member, the merchant, for some time. Maybe the family member can travel on the main floor with the party. Maybe this is a great time where you could role play some secrets where the family member says, oh, yes, I, I've been safe and he is treating me well. And maybe he sh that, that, that merchant shares some secrets with the players or tells the players where he is sleeping, where he's being held uh, in the castle. Now, after uh, the Explorer, Strahd does something unique at this point, and this is a great role-playing moment for the players and Strahd. And he says to the players, Before I take my leave so you may enjoy your dinner, I am sure you have many questions about Barovia. I shall grant each of you one question which I will do my best to answer. Now, this is a great, amazing role-playing opportunity between you, Strahd, and the players. He's going to allow each player to ask him a question, and he will do his best to answer. Now, Strahd will answer honestly. He will not lie or, or, or throw a red herring at the player. He will answer these questions honestly. However, Strahd might 
leave out some important details. He will tell the truth, but he might obscure some of the details of the truth that may personally benefit him. And I'll give you one perfect example of if you ask them a question, they might say, well, why is this green gem so important to you? Why do you need this green gem? And Stroud will say this. This gem is of no consequence to you, but it is important to me, as it is an ingredient to help return the life of my poor, dear mother, who was murdered. You would not deny a son's loving help for his mother. Now, while this is true, the players might have learned this as they're searching for the blue gem. Remember, there's the, the note from the soldier that talks about Strahd searching for this gem and wanting to restore his mother. So this is true. If he, if he gets these gems, uh, he's going to try to restore his mother. But he's leaving out some important elements. He doesn't want the phase to have the gem. He knows the phase of the enemy. He knows that this is a source of their power. So again, he will answer the questions honestly and truthfully to the best of his ability, but he might hold some information back. Do not, and I suggest, do not throw red herrings or lies at the party. Uh, just give them straight up truth. Just hold back some things that you think are uh, elements that Stride would probably hold back. Again, Strahd doesn't fear the players, so there's no reason to lie to the players. He's willing to give the players treasure. He's willing to let them leave. He just wants this green gem. So he's not antagonizing the players at this point, and there's no reason for him to do so. Now, as they finished answering the questions, Strahd will say before he departs, Midnight. Not one second later, be at the front courtyard. Now, I bid you farewell. Now, at this point, Strahd will disappear. He will just turn into mist and disappear, seemingly disappear. The reality of it is, is this is not Strahd. This has been an illusion of Strahd, a projection of Strahd. He has not put himself in danger. Players may realize this or come to this conclusion because Strahd never drinks the wine right? The blood before him. He is just there and he talks to players and then he just disappears into the mist. If the merchant is there, he leaves the merchant there. The merchant can't leave and will not be allowed to leave. Uh, no matter, under any circumstances, that merchant will not be allowed to leave unless they return the green gem. Now, uh, Strahd will also say, if these players were captured and they're in fine dinner attire, he will tell the players you will find your belongings in the carriage at midnight. And all the players' belongings, their armor, their weapons, their magic items, their gold, will all be in the black carriage. Strahd does not want to keep them. They're not valuable to Strahd. He's going to give them back, and he just put them in fine dinner attire, and, and they can leave in the carriage. It's not a problem. Now, if the players have already had their dinner with Strahd, and the players come back to this location, the organ will play the organ music again, and the players may have to run that, roll that wisdom save. Strahd is not there, and the table is empty. Now let's jump into the battle map here of the first floor. And here, here I am, I'm in there. Check him out, there's Strahd. And then Strahd disappears after we have his, his little discussion with us. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. I would really pull this out, unwind this, unpack this instrumental dinner with Strahd. There's so much going on here. The questions, the merchant, the quest for the green gem. Just, it's a really cool moment. Now, if the players uh, inspect the room and search for secret doors, behind each of these mirrors, these mirrors are two-way mirrors. You can see, I can't see through this mirror. But if my player character's on the other side of the mirror, I can see through it. These are secret doors that are two-way mirrors that allow you to see into the dining room. It's very, very cool. If you open these things, if the players find these, they can actually go through. But they are two-way mirrors. You can't see through one way, you can see to the other. Now, when the players do, if, if they do find that these mirrors uh, are secret doors, two-way mirrors, they will step into the South Archer's post. This room is cold and dusty. There's arrow slits that look over the front courtyard, and there's dozens of mirrors strewn about. Now, if the players look into the frame, one of the large mirrors, 
right? They will see Strahd, who appeared human and well-dressed from a far happier time in his life, and this image slowly fades. And what we're doing here is, again, this is an unsettling moment. It's also putting this weird dilemma in the player's head. Strahd was once human. He was once a prince. I just saw an image of him fading in this mirror. What did he do? What are the things that Strahd has done to go from a, a mortal prince to an immortal vampire? The horrific things that he's done, uh, the tormenting that he has been living through. And so this in image is this, this dichotomy between these two worlds of Strahd, Strahd's before the year 351 is this prince, and Strahd after the three, year 53-1 and uh, becoming the, the evil vampire and all the heinous acts that he has committed. If the players travel down uh, here to the, here's me traveling down, uh, to this room down here, it's a south turret post, and it's a giant turret post. It doesn't look like it's been used in, in decades, if not centuries. Player searchings will find 3D6 arrows strewn about this room. So it's a way to pick up some arrows, some missiles, if you don't have them. As you're heading down this hallway here, you'll see that it's very hard to see down the hallway. It's obscured with all these webs. The players that travel down this hallway, there is a 25% chance that players will be attacked by 1D4 plus 1 swarm of spiders. And we have those, let me see, do we have those spiders anywhere here or do I have to put them in? Let me figure this out here. I think I might have some in here. Nope, I'll just drag them in here. I'll show you. There they are. Here are our swarm of spiders. We'll just put them right here. There we go. So we got some swarm of spiders. Swarm of spiders will, will jump in and 1D4 plus 1 swarm of spiders will go in there and attack the players. If they go down this hallway, I would roll that uh, 1D20 every time they pass through this hallway on a 1 through 5, 25% chance they are attacked by a swarm of spiders. And there's a stairwell at the end of the hallway that leads uh, higher and lower. We'll talk about the upper and lower levels in a future video. Now, if the players we'll go back to the dining room, so that gives you an idea through the dining room and the secret uh, doors behind the mirrors to this area, as well as the turret and the spider spider hall. We're going to head upward now to the north part. Uh, of the main floor. And there's some stairs that rise here. There's some candles about the stairs. And they're gonna get up to this landing here. They're gonna see two rising stairs here on the grand landing. And let's talk about the grand landing. A large staircase is illuminated by several candles and leads to a landing 20 feet wide and 40 feet long here. Stone arches support a faded fresco ceiling 20 feet above your head. The frescoes depict armored knights on horseback in a great battle. And these are frescoes from the time of the Great War, the 27-year-old war that raged throughout Barovia with the Turk forces. That is some lore pulled from, I think, the second and third edition. As the sets of stairs on the south wall leads higher, they're flanked, there's two small alcoves right here. Each alcove houses a large suit of black armor. Each suit of armor wields a black mace with long serrated spikes. Now you're gonna notice here, I'm gonna zoom in here, uh, you'll notice that there are orange squares. These are invisible orange squares, and we have monk's active tile triggers. Now, if a player is standing in one of these squares, you're going to ask the player to roll a dexterity save DC 14. If they fail the dexterity save, you're going for any player, you're just going to click in this active tile in the orange square here, and that player, let me just clear this out, will take damage automatically. There they go. They took 1d8 plus 2 damage. That is from the uh, the um, the mace, the black mace. It does 1d8 plus 2 damage. Now, if the players uh, do any type of inspection, they'll notice the pl pressure plates. It's a DC 15 perception check. There's pressure plates in front of both of these. These these suits of armors are traps. They'll come out. They'll swing the mace. If they miss, uh, if the player jumps out of, out of the way on a DC 14 dexterity check, the mace misses them, and then the suit of armor goes back into the alcove. So it's a trap that, that's triggered by the pressure plate. The player can attempt to dismantle this trap uh, with some these tools. It's a dis, uh, DC 15 dexterity check. The trap can also be destroyed uh, by destroying the armor. They're armor class 18, five hit points. 
course they're immune to certain types of damage like psychic damage, what have you. However, if you disable or damage the trap, you can get these black uh, spike maces. These are black spike maces that do 1d8 plus 2 piercing damage uh, on these black spice maces and each of these suits of armor have these. And these stairs uh, obviously rise up to uh, K25 and we'll be covering that uh, in the next guide. Now if the players head to the east through these double doors here, they will be entering the Hall of Fate. Now as the players enter this hall, and let's take a look at this hall, it's covered in cobwebs. Let's shut this door, make sure the doors are shut. The players are entering this hall. Once all the players enter this hall, right, you say the great hall has shrouded in dust and stretches into the darkness ahead. Cobwebs hang like veils from the vaulted ceiling, and the hallways are lined with statues of knights whose eyes seem to follow you. Now, these knights are knights from a time long forgotten from the Great War. They're covered in cobwebs. Remember, Castle Ravenloft has been here for 700 years. And so these are knights that probably fought in the Great War, statues of some of the great knights that fought in that 27-year war. Now what happens here is this whole square, this whole area is one giant monk's active tile trigger. You can see it, I can highlight it right there. All you need to do is do this. Double click on this, and it will pull the players into this theater of the mind scene. So the players are now in this theater of the mind scene, and a ghost, begins to, tra a tra uh, one of the statues transforms into a ghost, and the ghost says, Who has entered the Hall of Faith? Have you served the righteous, or have you succumbed to your own greed, fears, lusts, and desires? Will you sacrifice for the greater good, or do you serve yourself? Now, I left this mechanically open. If you want to include some mechanics based on how the players answer, maybe it's some kind of reward. Maybe you want to give the player inspiration if they answer this honestly. Uh, or if they're a good player, you might want to give them inspiration or a luck point or whatever thing that you wish to give them. I left it open to you. This is one of those moments of dread. The doors have shut behind them. The, the room fills with mist, with a fog, and a ghost begins to talk to them. They are ready at this point. You've elevated the player character and the player's tension. They are locked in this room, or is seeming so locked in this room, and this ghost begins to speak with them. Now, this is a, the ghost itself is harmless. The ghost will disappear. He is just providing you a message from beyond the grave. These spirits have been trapped. These were soldiers that fought honorably in a great war, and they're giving you a message. And remember where this Hall of Faith goes. It goes from the main entrance of the castle to the chapel. So these were probably honored knights from centuries ago who were good, who served Barovia before this place became dark. And so that's why they were asking these questions. Are you heading into this chapel? The room is definitely dark and filled with cobweb, cobwebs, and certainly Strahd has no need to go down this hallway, nor does he have any interest going to the chapel. The chapel represents a time uh, in his past of good versus evil, and Strahd being a vampire certainly doesn't want to have any, any desires to go to the chapel. Now, once they've spoken and said these words, and if you want to role play this out, and the characters can answer however they want to, it comes another role play moment. You double click on Return to the Hall, and that will take all the players back to the hall, and you'll see that there's mist in the hall, the mist will disappear, and the doors will automatically open at the end. Again, this is all done through Monk's active tile trigger, so that this will bring up the, the battle map again, the hall will be covered in mist, a few seconds will pass and the mist will dissipate and the doors will open. And that leads into the chapel. And we have a chapel uh, scene here. Let's bring up our our uh, chapel, uh, Theater of the Mind. Whoop. Let me just get that here for you. Theater of the Mind. Ravenloft Chapel. There we go. 
So as the players stand here, and they're looking at this chapel, we've got this theater of the mind map of the chapel. The dark light filters through the tall, broken stained glass window, illuminating the ancient chapel of Ravenloft. Several bats circle the 90-foot tall dome ceiling, a balcony 50 feet, uh, uh, 50 feet behind you stands in the darkness on the west wall. In the center of the balcony, there are two shadowy figures sitting up there in high chairs. Old benches covered in dust litter the floor. A ray of light penetrates the stained glass window and it illuminates the altar. And upon the altar, you can see something here kind of blinking, illuminating the altar. It's a small silver statue. Slip next to the statue is a cloaked fi figure and it doesn't move. So this is a theater of the mind map. It gives you kind of the image feeling it sets a common frame of reference of what the players are seeing in this chapel. It's all dark and gloomy. The stained glass windows are broken, but there's something illuminating there on the altar, flickering in some light. It is a small silver statue. Let's jump back to the, the battle map here. As the players move forward here to the altar, they're going to see there's the slump figure, and there's this shaft of light shining on this flickering silver statue. Now we have an interesting encounter here. So we've just had a little bit of, of, of foreshadowing and some dread in the Hall of Faith. And as the players get here, you know, they see this kind of unsettling environment. There's some shadowy figures up there. The doors are open, they can see all of this. Uh, but what happens here is this. As the players, the slump cloak figure right here is the remains of Gustav uh, Herringast a lawful, evil human cleric who tried to obtain the icon of Ravenloft, but did not survive. If the player character touches him, so if the player character comes up here and say, I'm gonna investigate the dead body there, the player, the, the player character who touches Gustav's remains becomes possessed by the spirit of Gustav immediately. There is no dexterity save, no saves, no charisma saves, nothing at this point. They immediately become possessed by Gustav. Now the spirit of Gustav desires the icon of Ravenloft and will do anything to keep any of the other players from acquiring it. The player character will grab the mace, this giant mace sitting right next to Gustav. That's the Mace of Terror, by the way. I have that right here. It will show you. It's one of the items. Uh, there it is, the Mace of Terror, which is pretty damning. It's got three charges on it. You can use an action to spend a charge in the wave uh, tear. Each creature within 30 feet radius extends to you must succeed a 15 saving throw or become frightened for one minute. So he has this wave of terror. One, on the play, on the, so everybody's going to roll initiative, including the possessed player. Now, on the possessed player's turn, they must succeed a DC 20 charisma saving throw or they remain possessed by the spirit of Gustav. That player character attacks with the Mace of Terror, the closest target to them, or the target closest to the icon of Ravenloft. Now, each subsequent turn for that player character, that DC, uh, Charisma DC, declines by one. So the next player's turn, that Charisma DC declines to 19. This is representing the player struggling to get rid of this spirit that has kind of of taking them over. So the, the, the DC is declining each turn. It's DC 19 as they are struggling to get rid of the spirit um, in there. If they fail, the, the player character is going to attack his fellow party members. Now, the spirit of Gustav controls the body but does not deprive the target of its awareness. That's why struggling to try to get rid of the spirit. The spirit of Gustav can be targeted, cannot be. The spirit itself cannot be targeted by any spells or attacks or other effect other than ones that turn undead. The spirit of Gustav otherwise uses the, the, the possessed target, the player character stat block, but does not gain any access to the player's knowledge, the player's class features, or proficiencies. The possessed target will immediately grab the Mace of Terror as it is familiar with this weapon. Remember, the spirit of Gustav is familiar with this Mace of Terror, and he will use only that to attack the fellow players. He will stand close to the icon of Ravenloft as the spirit uh, desires it. Now, the possession lasts under one of the following conditions. Either the player succeeds on their turn, the charisma saving throw, and the spirit leaves. The possessed player's body drops to zero hit points, the, the spirit will leave. The spirit of Gustav ends the possession for some reason as its own bonus action. Or the spirit of Gustav is turned and forced out by an effect like uh, turn undead or dispel evil or good, and the spirit will flee at that point and leave the 
person to regain a player character to gain full conscious awareness of their player character. Now, when the possession ends, the spirit of Gustav will disappear. Now, note, I would have the player play Gustav, uh, play their character possessed. You don't have to take over the player character. Allow the player character to play Gustav. Just remember, they can only attack. They're going to make that charisma save at the beginning of their turn. They can only attack with a mace of terror. They don't get any other special features, class features, or anything like that. Uh, and maybe they can, you know, yell out, ah, stay away from the icon, you know. Maybe they take on the, the possessed possession of, of, of Gustav there as well. Now what happens is the bats, 1d4 plus 1 swarm of bats will swoop down from the ceiling if and when Gustav is possessed. And the bats will randomly attack any character. They'll attack Gustav, they'll attack the players. See, the bats are just up there and all of a sudden this activity, Gustav coming and attacking, has gotten the bats pissed off. So you as the DM will be running, it's going to be kind of a three-way combat encounter. You're going to have the player character fighting off the other players as the spirit of Gustav, trying to make these saving throws using his Mace of Terror. You have the bats as you as the DM controlling, you know, 1d4 plus swarms of bats that are going to be attacking, randomly attacking. I would roll a dice to have it randomly attack with a player or Gustav, the spirit of Gustav swarming down through the chapel. It's going to be a chaos in this chapter. We got the bats sitting right here. You just illuminate them and bring them in. There they are, the bats swooping in to attack the players from the ceiling, um, 1d4, and you have a pretty crazy combat encounter in here. Now, the body, if you search the body, the body will find a dark hooded cloak, chainmail, and the Mace of Terror. The dark hooded cloak is uh, embroidered with gold thread. It's worth 250 gold, and of course, the Mace of Terror. The icon of Ravenloft is there, and we've got the icon here. Let's take a close look at the icon. I've got a, a special uh, image for the icon. Let's take a look. View the item icon. There is the, the icon of Ravenloft, the silver icon of Ravenloft statue. Now this is rules as written, uh, the icon. If it requires entombment only by a good player with a good alignment to be able to use it, any evil player that picks up this statue is gonna take some serious hurt. This statue uh, here is going to, I forgot how much it lays down, but it lays down some serious hurt on any player that is uh, that is evil. I, I forgot what, what it is, it's something like, you know, 60, 10 worth of damage. So if you're an evil player, this is what happened to Gustav. He was fried by the statue. It does this massive amount of radiant damage. Oh, right here. An evil creature that touches the statuette must make a DC 17 constitution saving throw or take 16 D10 worth of radiant damage on a failed save. Holy crap. Or half as much on a successful one. This, this is what happened to the Gustav. He got fried because he was evil trying to take the statue. Now, one of the things that's important to remember about the statue, other than the rules it was written and the things about the good alignment and all its feature set, is this statue, the icon of Ravenloft, is a quest item for the suffering quest out of Argenbost. Remember, in the chapel in Argenbost, the revenant uh, priest there asks you to recover the icon of Ravenloft, and if you bring it back, the revenant priest will grant you spells out of his knowledge of his spell book as well as come to your aid to try to convince Vladimir Horngard to allow you to bring back the skull of Argenboss to unseal the crypt, the mausoleum there. So you can decide to keep it or you can decide this is an important quest item. This quest item might be pretty easy for you to snag too during the dinner of Strahd as long as you haven't gone and ventured onto different floors, you can be able to pick this this up, it might be able to do it even uh, with the players who have been captured, they don't have any weapons, they're gonna have to deal with, with Gustav and figure this out here, maybe figure out, use a makeshift weapon from uh, one of the benches or something to fight off, off Gustav and the bats that come and attack. That leads us to the upper part of the chapel. We come in here, the upper chapel, there's some stairs leading up in the north chapel access. In the alcove stands an eight foot tall uh, statues of knights, and you notice tears slowly down, running down the face. Again, this is an unsettling moment. The player character inspecting the tears will quickly realize they are dark red blood. When the player character makes this shocking conclusion, the statue blinks and the tears stop and disappear. The statues are harmless. Again, 
we are creating an element of unsettling element. When you do this, you don't know if it's gonna elevate up to dread or if it's gonna elevate up to terror and you wanna keep this roller coaster of terror going. To the south, if the players head south in the chapel, and we're gonna go south here in the chapel on the main floor, they will come into another alcove. And then this alcove, right, in this archway, at least the chapel, at least this huge stairwell is covered in cobwebs. Uh, and there's two knights again. The statues seem to move slightly. You hear a whispered voice. Well, I thought I was learning how to live. I've been learning how to die. That's actually a quote from Leonardo da Vinci. But they hear this whisper coming from the statues. Player characters inspecting the statues will notice nothing. The statues are harmless. So the statues are whispering. Again, creating this unsettling moment. Now, if the players venture forward here, uh, they will see the high tower circular staircase. And if you venture forward, the large stone spiraling staircase leads up and down around a stone uh, core about 20 feet wide. The dust and cobwebs fill the staircase, making it difficult to even see the ceiling. It does not seem to be of use in centuries. The stairs leading down, however, are blocked by a stone wall. You can see a stone wall there. A cool breeze blows through the crack in the stone wall, creating a uh, haunting, echoing sound. There's a foul odor coming up from there. Now, if the players get close and they inspect and look through it, they can see through the hole, a crack in the stone wall, the stairs continue to go downward. Now, the players could take uh, one hour to remove some of the blocks, and if they take an hour to remove some blocks, the players would be able to, to get through there and head lower down into, and this takes them down into the crypts. Remember, Strahd warned you, don't go down the crypts. There's a stone wall blocking the way, but if the players take an hour, they can move those blocks and head down into the crypts. Now, this covers all the accessible areas within the main floor of Castle Ravenloft. We've got some stairs leading up, stairs leading down, and the main areas. However, there are two locations here on the main floor as well uh, where the players can only enter it, one from outside and the other is from within the castle. So I'm gonna move my player over here and show you the other entrance. And this is to the servant's entrance. And this comes from the servant's courtyard. So if you're in the servant's courtyard, in the back of the castle, you'll notice a door. And this door is swollen shut. It's gonna take you a strength check to bust this door open. And when you come into this door, you come into this room here. This is the servant's entrance. And a dim light shines through the dusty window uh, in the east wall. The door is in the east leads to the servant's courtyard in the carriage house. Remember, there are carriage houses there as well. The room is covered in dust. In the center of the room is a table with a large book splayed open with an inkwell next to it. The door to the north hangs open on one hinge and it par partially lays open. And there's an opening to the south wall leads to a staircase that plunges down into the darkness. On either side of the stairs, plunging down in the darkness, stands two skeletons in chain mail holding halberds. Now they don't do anything, they're just standing there. They're, and they're, they're covered in a little bit of dust as well. Now if the players inspect the book, the book on the table, right here, let's zoom in here. You can see there's a book on the table. If you inspect the book on the table, you'll notice on the page are the player character's names are written out. Every player character's name is written out in there in fresh ink. You're like, what? If they look at the previous pages, it, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of names and every single name is crossed out. This is again, one of those unsettling moments. The players are coming to this self-realization. Those are probably other adventurers that came here and all their names are crossed out. What does that mean? Probably they conclude that they didn't make it. And now the players' names are written in fresh ink in this book. Now, if the players step towards the south to try to go down the stairwells, the two skeleton guards will cross their halberds and block the way from the players going down the stairs. They just block the way. Almost look like they automatically do it, like an automated automaton. They block the way. Now, if the players uh, try to get past the skeletons, touch the cows, and push through, the players will swing their halberds towards the player characters. Player characters must succeed a DC 14 dexterity save or they're gonna take 1d10 worth of slashing damage. The skeletons are automated to block the way and to slash the players. After they make the slashing move, they don't attack again. They just, 
and they just stay there. These are put in place by Cyrus Bellevue, who you'll learn more about, to protect the entrance to the stairs. He's also the one that put the names of the players in the books. Now, if the players dismount the skeletons after they've done the blocking and the swinging motion, they'll find that both wear a chain shirt, which the players can take, and both of them have these halberds, which they can also take. Now, this entrance heads down to the servants' hall just above the crypts area K62. So this is one way <coughs> to get down to the crypts. If the players go through this unhinged door to the north, they're gonna find this kind of, they're, they're gonna find this stone staircase in this room. The room is a disaster. Unbroken furniture, there's torn, torn clothes lay about the room. Uh, there's a mildew smell that fills this damp air. A cold draft blows through the cracked windows. And there's a narrow stone, stone staircase leading higher. Now, if they search the room, they'll find through the torn clothing that there is a beautiful dress. You're going to note a beautiful dress that seems to be recently torn, uh, shredded to bits, stained with blood. It doesn't seem to be that old. This is, again, an unsettling moment. It's going to foreshadow some stuff that players are going to find later on in Ravenloft here. Now, we have one more area on the main floor, and this area on the main floor is an area that they can only get to from within the castle, from within the crypts. Let me see, I'll put them over here. Within the crypts or uh, coming up through the tower. And that's right here. Let's talk about this. You're in the bottom of the Heart of Sorrow. This is the big, huge, whoa, huge circular tower. That, that rises up from Ravenloft. Uh, a slowly pulsing red light, and you can see that here, there's a pulsing red light, illuminates this room. Your eyes are drawn up this large tower above you. This circular tower is 60 feet wide. It's massive, giant crystal heart at the top of the tower beats slowly, and this red light pulses, illuminating this giant shaft in this giant tower. The large spiral staircase rises and winds the wall of this giant tower, and several circular landings are on each floor all the way up. A faded mosaic floor adorns the lower part of the tower, and in the center of the lower part of the tower are some stairs that lead lower. This is the Heart of Sorrow up there, and there's a whole bunch of mechanics and information about that. We're gonna be covering that when we get into the tower itself, into the spires, and talk about the Heart of Sorrow itself. These stairs lead down into the lower levels and decide, uh, descend into darkness. There's a faint, pungent odor that rises from this darkness, and this leads down to K-71, the Kingsman's Quarters. Now, the only way in here is coming down the stairwell through the Hearts of Sorrow or coming up through the crypts and through the Kingsman entrance up here. So there's only two ways in to here, coming in down through the Heart of Sorrow, the Tower of the Heart of Sorrow, or up through the crypts. Now you'll notice that there is a hallway here, and they'll head up this hallway. And this hallway, just like the other hallway, is really hard to see. You can see my character can barely see through this hallway. There's all these spider webs. And what happens is, as you head through this hallway here, about halfway through this hallway, you're going to see a body. Players are stum stumble upon a body. Previous adventure looks like to be wrapped in a cocoon right here. You can see that right here along the wall. Now, if the player wishes to examine the body, they must take the time to cut away the cocoon. This will trigger a giant spider to lower itself down from the ceiling and attack the player that's actually cutting it. This, this, the giant spider will gain surprise. It will lower itself out of the darkness of the ceiling. Remember, player's vision here, they can barely see. It's covered in cobwebs. Giant spider will fall right on top of the player and gain a surprise round and attack on the player. There's the giant spider. Comes down, lands right on top of the player and attack uh, the player. The beginning of round two, you're gonna have anywhere from uh, 1d4 two to five swarms of small spiders come in and begin attacking the player, joining in the attack at the beginning of round two. So uh, if the players do start cutting this cocoon, that spider's gonna go, hey, that's my food, and it's gonna go down there, and the giant spider's gonna be again attacking uh, the players who mess with that cocoon there. And so we got the giant spider hidden here. He's just off the map. We'll put the spiders here. But let's talk about what the players do find uh, in the Dead Adventures. They're going to find 1d20 plus 10 worth of gold pieces. 
They're going to find a dagger, quarter staff, and a black robe of darkness. What is this? The black robe of darkness is a rare and powerful uh, robe used by arcane magic users. The wearer of this robe can cast the spell's darkness or dark vision as a bonus action once per day. So darkness or dark vision if they wear and attune to this black robe of darkness. It's worth 300 gold. Uh, really cool. It also allows the players to, to, to realize what this adventure was. It was some kind of magic user. A robe of darkness, a dagger, a quarterstaff. Didn't make it. Obviously, it didn't make it here. Players end up heading down to the end of the hallway. They're going to get to the northern uh, post turret here. And in here, they're going to find, instead of, of uh, arrows, they're going to find 2d10 worth of crossbow bolts. And if they come down to the south here, they're going to be in the north archer's post, and they're going to find it, it's fairly well kept compared to the other parts that they've seen. There's going to be a crossbow. Uh, hangs on a bracket along the wall along with several boats. It's a heavy crossbow bow hanging there with 1d20 plus 4 crossbow bolts hanging on the wall there. So they are going to be able to get a nice weapon. If they don't have a ranged weapon, there's a heavy crossbow that they'll be able to find. But getting here is going to be difficult because the only way to get here is coming up through the crypts or coming down through the tower and then heading down this hallway, which you're going to encounter the, the, the giant spider and the small spiders to finally get there. This gives you the entire coverage of the main floor of Ravenloft. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you're having a wonderful Halloween. Please download the free player's guide, a campaign guide and player's guide in the link down below. We're going to be releasing new guides, edited guides each month. Really excited about it. And if you care and if you can, please join me and help me in this epic journey. Make this become a reality. Also, make sure to smash that like button, hit subscribe, and until next time, happy Halloween, and may all your roles be critically successful.